you think that's one of the reasons why um, a lot of people in the rum industry, certainly that we've met, are all very nice. To, it's not very. It's not a very catty, like vicious uh, industry. Like, can, like if you look at other other categories of spirits and stuff, it can all be a bit grim and a bit bitchy, to be honest. Whereas everyone in the kind of rum world. Certainly that me and Jack have met. I mean, it's only a fraction of the people, but they all seem very nice and friendly and um, then they're, they're never really going to slag off too much anyone else's thing apart from, you know, the odd brands that we all know that aren't necessarily great. Um, they're not really going to actually ever go in too hard on anyone else. They're going to be like, well, they're just doing their own thing. Like, you know, and, and we're all just trying to do our own thing. And that's what's so great about Rum. Do you think that's do you think that's the reason why people rum people tend to well certainly come across a bit nicer? I don't know what people say behind our backs. <laughs> no, I, I think you're right because I think the way that the, the rum is a category, and we're not talking just now. Say in the last twenty years or so, rum as a category is seen as that island tropical haven. You know, it's a beach, it's the Caribbean. You're on holiday could be a honeymoon, you're going to get a rum punch on arrival, you know, it's sun, sea, sand and rum, simple as, and maybe a bit of a latter one as well. But that's it. It's not like gin where the, the way I've always perceived gin is maybe not the way everybody else does, but it's very quintessentially English. I, I know it's a Dutch product, inspired by, shall we say, but everyone just presumes that gin is made in London. That's the re common response I got. When I asked that question, it my gin tastings, especially 10 years ago. Same for rum. I said, oh yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's made in the Caribbean. And they'll rattle off Old Jay, they'll rattle off Kraken, they'll rattle off all these other spice rums, and then Bacardi, maybe Havana Club. But people now want to learn so much more. And I think because of the way that we as brand ambassadors, you guys as bartenders and operators who want to show off the category in a better light, you're more approachable because it's the shirts that you wear. It's the demeanour that you have. You know, I know, I know, I wear a lot of these, of course, because it's it's obviously our enforcement. But I, I I know for the fact that I actually found a photo last night. I posted up when I MC the Russian Standard Cocktail Comp uh, final in 2015, and that was the era I was wearing waistcoats, and that was the era I I saw more gin rum. People wanted to. You have to look quintessential, not saying quintessential in English has a waistcoat, but every gin tasting I wore a waistcoat. Now I wear these, and I wear these in general life anyway, but I happen to wear a waistcoat for work stuff. So even though know, the way you present yourself is how people are going to, I suppose, accept what you're going to say. You know, if you walk into Smuggler's Cove or my, or my Marigo Bay and they saw me in a waistcoat or they saw you guys in the top hat, you're thinking, this is not rum. This is. <laughs> This is like a cosplay in the wrong play. You know, Peaky Blinders, great example. If you're not wearing a flat cap, you're not doing it right. <laughs> yeah. it's, what, it's what I really like about rum as a category as well. It's, you can still have that level of like professionalism, um, but at the same time, there's always that kind of element of, of fun with it. It doesn't, keep, it doesn't seem quite as prim and proper as something like, say, with like Scotch. You know, there's kind of like that almost like gentrified, gentlemanly kind of, it, it just seems a bit more serious, right? If you were to go, if someone said like, oh, um, there's such and such whiskey bar, I'd kind of expect it to look a bit more like clean cut and a little bit more modern, a little bit more shiny, a lot of glass shelves, polished bottles. Whereas if someone said like, go to a rum bar, expect it to be like a bit, little bit more dingy, not quite as like Hello, neat and organised. <laughs> a bit of fire, it's probably gonna. You're probably gonna see some somewhere. Do you know what I mean? Um, well, it's... I, I, you know what? But to, sorry to interrupt you, but I think I know why. I think it's because of what you can do with it. If you think whiskey at a push, you're gonna probably order an old, like an old fashioned of some sort. It's a sipper. It's gonna retain the flavour profile of your whiskey, whether it's Irish, Scotch, Japanese, American doesn't matter. And because traditionally you just have it on its own or over a little bit of water. That's how people perceive it. To have an old fashioned, to have a Rob Roy, to have a Sazerac, or no, not Sazerac, um, Manhattan. You, that's a slight upgrade, but it's still retaining obviously a lot more of the booze of the whiskey itself. 
with rum, you say rum, you're like, oh yeah, pina colada, miso, daiquiri, um, and you just rattled off three classics without even realising it. But you don't do that for the whiskey category. You will never do that with brandy. Brandy's the same as whiskey. You have that sort of, I don't know, like you say, clean cut, modern, sleek, everything's shiny, everything's, uh, you know, polished. And it, it always has that kind of refined look to it. Where if you think rum, you think dark, dingy, tiki bar, lots of fire. But you, well, if, let's use a lower when it was open as a good example. You wouldn't pop in there for a double Ray Nephew over ice. You pop in there for well. a nuclear daiquiri. <laughs> in <don't> a suit. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if you pop into, uh, what, what's the whiskey bar uh, in Liverpool? I can't remember its name. Mackenzie's. Mackenzie's. If you pop into Mackenzie's, are you going to expect fire? You're going to expect yeah, they're all puffy. You know, <laughs> tiki, lots of lots of uh, you know colour, lots of sugar. No, because that's not what the category demands for. You, you're going to ask for a, probably a cigar and a whiskey and a little bit of jug of water on the side because that's what whiskey is all about. You know, I would have be probably looked at it a little bit wrong if I had, came in with this shirt into Mackenzie's. They were like, hey, the rum bar's down the road. Oh yeah, oh yeah, for whiskey. That's just unfortunate the way it is, but. It's, yeah, the, the category itself needs people, and I think it has helped the last couple of years of how many brands are out there now and how many brands are actually making an effort to identify themselves, not just for the age demographic they would normally do. You know, think Monkey Shoulder. Monkey Shoulder whiskey is a blended whiskey that came out for the kids. Not the kids of, like, eight-year-olds, but the teenage market, the young adults, you know, the 18 to 25 market. They did a massive... Um, publication marketing support with the enemy magazine because that's the age graphic they wanted to go for and that was the kind of people they wanted to focus on where the likes of glenn Fiddick and balvenny and dalmore and Demarangi and mccallans and all that lot were still not saying ignoring that but they knew that if they started to move away from their age graphic at the time of like you know mid 30s to late 60s that's what that's the people who grew into the brand when it became single malt in the sixties itself. Now, unfortunately, they are obviously dying away, as you would do. And we now need to realise we need to go for more cocktail drink ones. I mean, how many whiskey highballs have I seen on menus lately? It's huge, you know, and not just the blended whiskies. You know, it's not just Shivers Regal. Shivers Regal eighteen year, thinking about it, looked about on their Instagram. I'm like, Shivers eighteen in a cocktail. Sounds amazing. I'd love to make one. But that's like 60 quid a bottle. Yeah. All right. You know, so even now, you, you, 20 years ago, you never see Shivers 18 in a cocktail. My God. But now they're forcing themselves to be relevant, you know, with new packaging, with new ways of enjoying it. It's not all about drinking on its own. Have it with this. Have it a long serve. Have it a short serve. Have you tried this amazing bar that's not a whiskey focused bar? But it's actually a rum bar that uses our whiskey, an amazing Jungle Bird or amazing Twist on a Manhattan that uses a bit of, you know, I'll tell you what, Negroni, great example. You have it with whiskey, have it with rum, have it with both, ever with Campari. Tastes really nice. You never think of it because Negroni is a gin cocktail. Or you're bringing like three different modes coming together. We're in this very exciting era now where so many crossovers, people are trying to get away from that defined demographic of, well, I've, I've passed my 21st, so I can't have anything from, like, Sambuca anymore. I need to be moving on to more quintessential spirits. Well, no, if you like Sambuca, you just drink Sambuca. Drink until you're 65. I don't care. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I'll have Sambuca with some coffee. I like it in your morning coffee. You know, crapper, great example. When I had the um, Sado pop-up bar with Peace Express, everybody came in, oh, I'm, this is a Nardini. What's, what's Nardini? Oh, it's a crapper. Oh, oh, I don't like grapper. Oh, okay. Well, can I get you a drink? They'll look for the menu. I purposely have the word grapper off the menu. But they come across a lemon martini. It's got gin. It had Warren Edwards um, lemon balm. And it had Nardini Aqua de Tidra. That's a lemon-based grapper. And it all had was a lemon-based um, Italian spirit. So I didn't say the word grapper. And it was uh, paired up with lemon balm from Warren Edwards and something else. I can't remember what it was off the top of my head. I did like it, enjoy it. So, oh, yo, how was your grappa martini? So, oh, no, it was a lemon martini. Oh, dude, it actually had grappa. Here's the bottle. And I freak him out. It's like, well, I don't like grappa, but that was really nice. I said, I know. 
because you're just thinking outside the box. You're not being that person who, oh, I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't like grappling. I, I was, you know, my, my family never drank it, so I would never drink it. Do whatever you want, as long as you like it. It's, it's like exactly what we were saying before. Stop going off the cover of a bottle. Just try the inside. You might like it. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I think, um, to be fair, I think people these days are getting slightly more adventurous with what they want to drink. Um, but it's still, sometimes you'll have that odd, odd person that's like really stubborn about it. It's like, oh, oh no. I Only Malibu and Coke! Yeah. <laughs> I think there's definitely like a cultural thing as well, um, certainly in the UK where there's been this thing where people really do seem to kind of they seem, they seem to be a bit more willing to pay a bit more of a premium for the likes of you know something that is deemed as being like quote unquote quote craft you know like obviously all the kind of beer it, it, within the beer industry people are kind of like getting away from the mainstream lagers for example and trying stuff a little bit different and i think it seems a little bit similar with spirits i think if you've got like a little bit of a sexy story behind it and you've got the time to tell them that in a bar you'll be able to convince someone to maybe try something a little bit different but what i like about rum so much is the fact that you know nine times out of ten when you are giving them this sexy story it is actually legit and it's grounded in something interesting whether it be you know a cultural thing from wherever the rums come from or how it's made how it differs to other things it is actually like authentic, you know, it's not just some market employee with like a bit of like fancy language and a snazzy bottom. It's actually, it's there in the liquid and it's one thing to try and convince someone to, to try something. It's completely different for them to come back again and again and get more or get, you know, try something else, but from the same brand, something like that. And I think that coupled with the fact that within rum, it doesn't feel like in a lot of instances, you're kind of getting priced out to buy it. Um, a lot of rums we've mentioned today, the Chairman's 2005, like any of the Four Square exceptional cast selection, um, a few things like I've got for the home bar during this lockdown just to keep me going. You know, I've got like a uh, Worthy Park, um, Hamden's a little bit more premium price and wise. But that's the most expensive bottle I got in. And they're all, you know, sitting between kind of like 40 and, and 90 pounds, which certainly isn't cheap by any means for, a, you know, but for a premium bottle of spirit, if you're looking to get anything half decent on the whiskey market, you're looking for two and a half, three X that price for something that's got a similar kind of like, um, you know, age within the bottle and quality and complexity. It almost feels like if you're trying, if you're a bit of like an enthusiast trying to get into it, you're almost priced out. In, in some of these categories whereas rum it really does feel like they've sort of found the sweet spot where you can try these things and you're not breaking the bank and likewise you know for us in bars when we're thinking about you know coming up with new specs and recipes for cocktails it is difficult sometimes because you do have to consider you know the gps and how much bottles cost to get in and how much you're gonna have to sell the you know the cocktails for we couldn't really where we're based in Liverpool, even though we're on the docks and it's in quite a premium spot, there aren't many people out there that are going to want to come in and spend fifteen pound on a cocktail. You know, and there, there are certainly places in the country and certain bars where you could do that, and as a result, you can get away with using more premium stuff. Um, but it doesn't mean that we're in any way hindered by the fact that we have to think a little bit about the cost of stuff because there's plenty of amazing products out there that start at that very low kind of price range. You know. No, true, you're absolutely right. I think, yeah, that more availability and obviously the larger range, especially, like you say, these days as well, um, is giving more options. You know, whiskey is traditionally seen as more expensive, especially your brandies. Even tequilas, you know, the, the age profile they have is obviously a lot younger than ours, but they're not the cheapest of range to it, you know, get in either. But rum, if you take away the spiced flavour profile, if you just go for a pure rum with no additives, shall we say, uh, in regards to adding something to it, there's so much out there. You know, like Marigo Bay, as an example, was purely Caribbean, and I could have easily filled those shells four times over, and it was 146 bottles purely from the Caribbean itself. And that didn't include half the brands I wanted to get in mm. that I couldn't because there was nowhere to put them. You know, so there's so many more options. You know, there's, there's still... I, I, I had no worthy part in those shells. They could have easily had some... You know, I have one Hampton estate, 
I could have had both. Uh, you know, I could have had their own group as well, but there was no room. But I'd have something from each one of them. It was it was difficult. But it's but that's the amazing thing about this. There's so many more options to go for at a really good value price. You know, with, with all these Facebook groups at the moment, I think I'm on the vast majority, if not all of them, at the moment. And it's interesting to sort of see the old Amazon flash sale. And you're like, oh, that's a really good price. You know, that's Hampton Estate down from 46 to 39. I'm like, that's a really good price anyway, 46 quid for, you know, somebody that's propped the Hampton Estate where you could spend 46 quid on a 12-year-old Scotch whiskey. I'm not saying that's not a bad liquid that they've made themselves, but it's a very, very different, you know, production methods, even though it's similar in the aging profile and obviously the use of the stills, but it's a different grain, it's a different base ingredient, and it's a different loving behind it. So at the moment, for what we are doing in the category of rum, for what you guys are doing, selling over bars and in cocktails, what I do is selling rums to you guys and yourselves. So much more we can do with it. I'm not saying I'd, I'd fail in this in the whiskey element, but I've never had a successful whiskey, and I've tried three or four that I work with. They've never done as well as I would like them to do if I have the same mentality as rum, and it's down to price. I think, like certainly from our point of view as well, like I I did up pretty much all the pricing for our rum and smugglers at the moment, and some of the more expensive stuff, like I think, is very generous compared to was it um jack was it jazz maybe that brought up the point when we were trying when he come in to speak to us this is jazz from um skylet that is Amazon. yeah yeah william george and things like that yeah um all the sps yeah, range what was it was it cri- the four square criterion or something that we charged yeah. like nine pound a shot for and he said it's about 22 quid a shot in london at the moment or something yeah on yeah. the prices though isn't it on the prices yeah like i think everything like we don't make we certainly don't make a lot of money on the high end stuff if if at all really um but then i, I, did, I didn't mind either you know, yeah. the gp wasn't high i just wanted people to try new things Mm. you've got to make it affordable even if it's you're not going to make oh I'm not going to hit 64% JP on this or 80 or whatever you're like yeah but I'll probably sell more of it and the brand will appreciate me making an effort for them to try something new you know if, if, if you like Nelgate okay, try St. Nicholas Harry oh never happened before. oh well this is actually only fibre yes it's a 12 year yes it costs me 200 quid a bottle you know what give it a go because you might like it the only way to do that is to have an affordable price I think it it helps as well, like, um, you know, if people want to try something, say in the, you know, some of these bottles, if you still spend £100 on a bottle or nearly £100 on a bottle, is expensive, you know. Like, I couldn't afford to probably do that right now. Like, I couldn't afford to just go and buy, you know, uh, Hampton Great House. Well, half of one is uh, in Jack's house <laughs> waiting for me. That's <laughs> the liquid. Uh, yeah, I can't wait to try it. I still haven't tried it. Um, I might come and get it actually off you after this. Yeah, that's fine. Um, well worth the trip. Yeah. Okay. Socially distant, of course. We'll meet outside. Yeah. <laughs> to, to be fair, you, you've just reminded me, when I did um, the last Room on the Couch live, obviously I had the four bottles, that Plantation Isle of Fiji, uh, the St. Nicholas Abbey Overproof. When I had the um, Bellier Tiger Shark, same match that they made, and the Four Square Patrimonio. Obviously, all four bottles have never been opened before. Uh, and obviously, two of them have had before. Oh, I hate you. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> I'm just going to say, I've got, I've got a confession to make, right? So, I tuned into the first one. Um, and I'm not going to lie, I didn't watch the second one purely because I was so jealous of the selection that you had. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't want to have to sit there and watch you drink them and not have at least like one to try along with. You know what I mean? I just was like, I'm not just going to sit here and torture myself and just watch someone else drinking all these. <laughs> I, I imagine that. that it was. I imagine it was a solid tasting. Oh yeah, it was. Uh, it was worth the effort for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But what, what, what I was, was going to say was, they're not the cheapest bottles, especially the latter two. The Overproof St. Nicholas Abbey, um, 60% ABV, but it's a good, I think, £10 more than Ray and Nephew, which is obviously is a higher ABV in its own right. So it's, about it's 50 not cheap. Then. Mid-40s, 50? Something around that? 
think it was mid thirties, maybe thirty six. I may, I may be wrong. I'm, I'm trying to remember on that one. I thought Ray um, was just like a shade over the these days. I think so. Maybe I'm... the the plantation by the Fiji. I can't remember how much that was. I think that was late twenties, early thirties, maybe. Um, but obviously the t- tiger shark was one sixty, and the patrimonio was one ninety. There's only 30 quid difference, but obviously it's a free figure sum in its own right. And we're heading, obviously, more for the 200 mark as well. Yeah. And I think I said, on this, obviously, you didn't, you didn't watch it. You should go back and watch it, by the way. It's a good hour. Um, but I do say, and this is a good thing. This is also sort of similar to what you were saying before, of how rum reps don't just stick to what they are. They're more than happy to try other things. And that's something I've prided myself in. But you know, if you go on my Instagram, if you go on my Tricks of Views social media, it's not all about the brands I work with. And I posted something about Russian Standard, like I said last night. It's vodka, and it's not even the vodka I look after. I still did a gig with Russian Standard, you know, and I still will hold up a bottle of Picardy if I'm in Chairman Reserve. You know, it's the rum as a category. You've got to understand what everybody else is doing, what it tastes like. Anyway, so I said that on the uh, my broadcast if this was a blind tasting i would have said that the tiger shark the way it tasted would have actually been more expensive i would have said that was 190 pounds not 160. when i obviously checked how much these prices were i think it did it there and then on the live broadcast it's like wow tiger shark, 160 yeah that's, that's not a price but for what you're getting not knowing what the yeah, distilleries are but the blend and the flavor profiles are Beautiful, you know, it's really good liquid. When I saw the price of the 190 of the patrimony, I'm thinking, worth it. Don't be wrong, it's a great liquid, but it's not worth 190 pounds. So how do you get a customer to buy that bottle? Well, obviously it's four square anyway, so it's probably probably not gonna be bloody available. But if I bought a bottle, which I did for the bar, but I bought it at the latter end of the bar being open, which is why I never actually got around to opening it in the first place. When I bought that, I was going to sell it, I don't know how much, but at a, a lower price, say, if you like that, try a four, you know, if you like four squares, Dominus, or, uh, I can never pronounce that word, sagacity. sagacity. <laughs> Why don't you try this? It's something a little bit different. It's a higher ABV, and it's 550, or it's six quid, or it's nine pound, or whatever. It's the only way of people to try something that's actually about 200 quid. When they can make their own mind up, because I always tell the truth, someone said, what do you, do you like this? You know what, it's not for me, but it does offer this profile. And so why is it not for you? Well, I actually quite like the more Barbadian St. Lucia style. I like my Jamaican funk. But for me, that's just a bit too more sherry profile. I don't like sherry, unless it's PX. But this is a drier profile. So again, as I was saying before, it has that legitimacy that you know what you're talking about because you tried other profiles as well and not just top your favourites. Like someone says, oh, like, yeah, I love a good overproof. Oh, Ray, nephew. But you've got six hundreds. You've got what? What's that rum bar? You've got, oh, no, you don't want them. Have you tried them? No, I don't, I don't drink Ray, nephew. Well, what's the point of you being there? What's the point of you stocking so many different rum brands if you're not going to bother even experiencing yourself to see what it can do? Do you it's think that's the, the, do you think that's the same in other categories though? Do you think uh say a lot of I certainly know uh, uh people that make some gin uh that that I won't mention, but they certainly try other people's gins. Do you reckon gin like sort of ambassadors? I know obviously you're kind of you are one as a as a side side yeah. little side piece. Um, but do you think other like people that are solely gin ambassadors? Do you think they actively try different gins to try and compare it to their whatever they're selling, or do you think that is just purely a? Because it seems like a very rum thing. Like I don't think a lot um, of other people do that, other than just blindly to slag them off. <laughs> you know. I think. So, so well, I'll tell you what. Something I've always said. I do get bartenders asking me, how, do, how have I got to where I am now? Because obviously, as I said at the beginning of all this, I am and was a bartender, shall we say. And the first thing I always say is, work for the brands you actually like. Because it, as we 
spoken about, it shows better when you're pitching that brand to a bartender or a consumer. If you don't get behind it, you don't like it, then why are you working with it? It doesn't make any sense. But that doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean you don't like the category. Obviously, there's something you do like to aim for that. And I was very lucky with Gem Reserve, but an opportunity arose and I took it. And if someone says, oh, but, you know, I, I really like Chairman's Bob, so you've got it. Well, don't stop me from you know, having you pitch it. You know, also we have sales guys across the UK who have been working Germans longer than I have because, you know, they predate me. Um, I, I made it as a great example for Scotland. He's been doing Germans for years since it came out in 2008. And he, he loves Germans. You know, he's been to say literally he loves the brand. I love it more because I embrace everything about it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he will say, well, it's just Germans to me and nothing. He's going to try Bacardi. He's going to try that new plantation. He gets an idea what a Cadbury is. I will always say, if you want to focus on gin, try other people's gins. Oh, it's, it's a rhubarb here. Have you tried the Warner Eppers rhubarb? Have you tried the Slingsby rhubarb? Have you tried this local rhubarb that's probably never going to get outside its limit, but it's obviously going to hamper you trying to sell rhubarb gin in that town because everyone's going to keep it open. So like, you've got to understand what everybody else is doing. You know, even if it's a liqueur, people are going to buy a liqueur because that's how the marketing works. You've got to get an understanding. Same with whiskey. If you're selling um, you know, a blended whiskey and it's monkey shoulder, try Johnny Walker. Try Shivers Regal. Try any of the new guys who are bringing out a blended whiskey and see what makes yours different, especially in the price range. If you don't do that, you're never going to be a good rep because you're blind to what everybody else is doing. And if you don't, if you're blind to what everybody else is doing, you're not going to know what's coming out in the future. Then why? There's no point. You know, it's great. But the festivals are a good example. Gin Fest, especially, always happen over bank holiday weekends, uh, especially in the summer, of course, as well. And it's a great networking for our point of view because it's like, oh yeah, I'm not seeing it since the last festival, or I'm not seeing it since you moved to this gin brand. And that's the thing: people do move between different brands, especially uh, within the category, shall we say. Uh, you know, I've known people who work for, say, Martin Miller's and then moved to Warner Edwards. You know, two very different gins, but very two different brands. One's got more expressions within it, flavor-driven ones as well. And it's great because you're like, oh, yeah, you know, but what's Martin Miller's doing these days? They brought out that nine moons. Oh, I wasn't there. I'm not going to try it. Because you want to try what Martin Miller's are bringing out. If you leave Warner Edwards, like I did, they brought out three new expressions since, I think, like the raspberry and the, the hawthorn. Is it for me? It's all right. I like it. I probably do have to sell it. But what's it's not like a uh, not like Pinkster. That's a lovely one. Very very different. How do I know that? I could tried Pinkster when it came out, so I knew what I was up against. The only way to really get ahead of the game, and to obviously from your point of view, that's what you want to know. Because if you say to me, if I walked into Smugglers with a gin and said, "I've got a new gin. This is what it is. This is the botanicals in it. This is the ABV." Our signature says this, it grows well with this garnish and this tonic water. And you're like, awesome. How's the difference to this one? It's exactly the same botanical. It's like, oh, I, I, I don't know. Well, you're going to look at me like an idiot. I'm not doing my homework. Well, I don't yeah. want to be doing that, especially if it's my first job, you know, my first ever brand. You're going to be thinking, I'm an amateur, even though I could be, I don't know, been in this industry for years, could be the best bartender in the world who's been finally moved on to the bar and, you know, other side of the bar. I and mean, when I screw up with something as simple as that, well, it doesn't matter who you are, you need to know what everybody else is doing. And if you can try it, that's fantastic. And a festival is the best way of doing that. You know, my run fest, nobody stakes on, on their own stands when it's a quiet period. I'm walking around and trying new things, yeah. you know, catching up. Oh, there's that new plantation on the feed. It's a little bit of a go. I'll tell you what, have you tried our new spice one? And it's all swapping and something. Same with gin, whiskey fest are the same. It's the only way to understand the category that you're working in. Best way of doing it. We actually, uh, we actually, me and um, uh, me and Big Steve did one with uh, our secret gin. That's like obviously made by Manchester, but for just for New World. Well, wow, our secret gin that's obviously made in Manchester. Great <laughs> <laughs> Marcus experience. Yeah. Selling uh, yeah. it to me. Yeah, uh, well, it's delicious. I helped come up with the recipe, so you know it's good, Dave. Come on. Uh, but we did like uh, we did like this gin to my tonic uh, event. Uh, it was um, it's actually right next door to my house. It's the exhibition center in Liverpool. Um, so there's obviously loads of other gin people there, 
and it's kind of people that you you kind of already met anyway like i'd already met anyway uh through like my old job and stuff and it was just weird seeing them in that thing do you know what's really horrible about stuff like that is you have to say the same thing over and over and over again for like eight hours yeah, but if you ask me a question about chairmen, I can give you an answer straight away. Because I've oh, been yeah, doing yeah. it over and over and over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> it's like very rehearsed, but it's like you get into the thing and you it's just like, I get I just get tired of saying the same jokes over and over again. <laughs> I'm I no don't. one laughing. Ever. I don't. <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you what, like you reminded me. I did a Cotter of the City, the last one in Manchester. No. I've been... Um, uh, 2018, we, we launched Bounty Run in Manchester on that day. And we partnered up with 31 Dover, the uh, online retailer. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, they had their own section of the uh, space in Manchester. I can't remember what the building was now. Uh, and it was six brands. And you basically bought a ticket for a, a, it's like a flight. So you had two rows. You're going to pick the second, first row or the second row. I think I was in the second. And I was next to Jameson. Before that was a gin. I can't remember what, what gin it was. Five and six lift. You pay, I don't know, ten. You hit the first bit, it's six lift, and you hit the second bit, you get Ben and Jameson, the last bit you get some bounty. And Andy, who obviously you guys know, uh, it was his first gig with me. And he'd never really seen me host anything. You go see you guys have. And I'm a very informal person. I try and obviously get everybody involved. You know, what do you get from this? You know, it's, I know what spice you're in there, but can you tell me what spice you're in this one? And Andy never realised how repetitive I am with the jokes as well. You know, it's like, you know, I, I can't remember what they were, I can't think of any uh, an example off the top of my head. But he said, like, after the sixth group, it's like, do you just you copy and paste, don't you? I said, well, yeah. if everyone laughs, <laughs> there's no point not saying the same joke because it's new people. And all right, they may see me again in the future, but I'm not going to know that. So it's sort of, yeah, you do get a bit repetitive on the same thing. If, it, if a joke doesn't work, definitely don't do it again. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Weird look, you might have it wrong, I don't know, but it's, it, it, there's only so many quirky whims you can sort of say. And obviously without offending anybody as well, which is sometimes very, very difficult, especially when you're talking rum. The historical values that rum has, it's, it can be difficult. To... Well, yeah, we, uh, um, <laughs> in our rum class in work, we... We always start off. I always do the the classic joke of uh, I'm going to start on a, a light note and talk about slavery. Yeah, you know, like it's always. <laughs> <laughs> see, you get a laugh though every time. Every time the lights go down, like <laughs> drama hits. Well, that's Apart the thing. that one time, <laughs> it's so it is it's difficult to obviously get to be engaging, especially when it's a. a um, Part of history of like that as well. Yeah, um, it's it's obviously I, I've spoken about it many a times. Um, and I, I, I tell you what, I actually found it quite difficult in the Caribbean because it's, you are in the centre where everything happens. And I couldn't. I'm not saying I'd say I say it differently in the UK, but even though I knew what I was going to say wasn't going to offend uh, the guys and girls who I was teaching in Saint Lucia, for example, I still sort of said a disclaimer. I said, "Look, this is how we." I, I tell you what, I'm going to say what I actually said. Well, this is the presentation I use in the UK. I'm going to relay it as I do. But I tell you what, you know what I'm like, because obviously I, I got to know him before we did the trainings and so on and so forth. Yeah. And I'm going to say it. Now, please, don't be offended. But if I am saying something I shouldn't be, you let me know. And I wasn't saying that obviously you should know, you know, it's going to offend you or anything like that. But sometimes the only way to do it is to actually ask, the, island, uh, the guys on the island themselves, who obviously, not saying obviously they lived in it, because they haven't, but their ancestors were done. And sometimes, as brutal as it could sound, and I apologise if it comes across differently when other people are watching this broadcast at a later date, but you've got to ask those questions to get the right answers so we can relay it in the best way possible. Because it's something you can't dismiss if you're talking a history of run. You know, I, whether you guys do it from your Smuggler's Co. point of view, whether I do it from a St. Lucia Distillers or a general rum, someone's going to ask the question, you've got to have the right answer. And I think... Sorry. I was going to say the, the only way we can probably be more informed about it is by asking those questions. So, and like, like you said, you know, the last thing any of us want to do is like get anything wrong or anything like that, especially on like... In the social media like age as well. Yeah. 
especially a day like today where it's uh, Blackout Tuesday. Yes, true. Hashtag. <laughs> And all that jazz. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we will t- always try to, we're not consciously not saying, like, saying incorrect information is probably, like, the best way to say it. So no, the only way to find out is to ask, you know. Um, no, yeah, you're absolutely right. Better play it safe and sorry, but also, obviously, keeping it engaged, you know. Nobody wants to be bored after an hour, do they? Absolutely. You know, I, you know, I could do a three-hour training session for you guys. So, <laughs> well, if you want to be bored after an hour, do a Jack Mitchell, uh, Jack Mitchell run mass class. <laughs> Another one, one, of those, one, of those, one of those, one of those signature <laughs> jokes. <laughs> trying it out. Uh, oh yeah, it's already in there, mate. It's been in there for years. <laughs> you want to get that guy behind the bar to do one? If you're not entertained. Get him to do it. You'll be asleep. <laughs> Was there uh, anything else you wanted to touch on, Andy, today? Because I've just realised you've been going for a few hours already, at least, I think. Yeah. Um, it, it's going to be a two-part, I'll put it that way, I think. <laughs> yeah, we might chop it up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, cool. I will. But, yeah, was there anything else we kind of wanted to ask? Or, I've Dave, got is there one anything more you question. kind of wanted to mention? I was going to Go say, ahead. have you got any questions to ask us, Dave? Flip the table, flip the tables. Um, well, I'll tell you what, obviously, because obviously you guys are Smuggler's Cove, you are, in my mind, you know, Brown talks about Smuggler's Cove, it's either, either or, or both of your names are always mentioned. So I suppose you are the face of what Smuggler's is all about. Now, I know that you guys obviously have made Smuggler's with the range of runs that you've got, uh, and sort of brought in, you know, from your worthy parts, your hand in the States, I know for a fact that you are essentially, from the St. Lucie Distillers' point of view, the biggest rum portfolio um, that we have. You, know, you have nearly everything that we have to offer, and will do with everything else in the bear before you. And that's a great thing because you made Smuggler's Cove, I, I, I'm not saying it wasn't originally in, like, say, the Alan Smallman era, but that was great for the pots and menu side. And it maybe lacked a bit of focus on the actual rooms themselves. What you guys are doing, obviously, making some great cocktails and adding some amazing rooms that are both relevant to today without thinking, what am I going to get out of this as of a brand point of view? So my question to you both is now, A, what made you decide to do that? And to have some of us code, has that helped the opportunity for you to be able to bring in stuff like the Worthy Parks, the Hamptons, the 1931s? And if you haven't been able to do that, so obviously with lockdown, what's the plan after this? Are you going to carry that mentality on, or are you going to have to restrict yourself a little bit because of what COVID uh, does to you? If that makes any sense. Yeah, the yeah, chat you want me to go, yeah. <laughs> I, I was just, yeah, because I, I knew that I would start talking, then you'd start talking, and then... <laughs> so yeah, you, you, what, you go first. <laughs> okay. Um, so from my point of view, like, I, I certainly done a lot of these uh, sort of updates for our current, men- well not even our current menu, we're kind of still waiting on a reprint and stuff like that but like certainly the rooms that we have in at the moment were, it was pretty much my baby for a good while and it was a good while of research and descriptions and you know writing things for a menu where you know someone can read like a little bit of information about a room and kind of Ideally, in a few lines, you want something concise and kind of a bit of where it's from, but then a bit of that kind of flavour profile as well. So someone's not going to be too overwhelmed, but they're going to understand kind of what the base of the rum is if you've not heard of it before, uh, from my point of view. Um, And then all this stuff that kind of, all this new stuff that we've got in that's really, or newish, newer rather, Um, because it hadn't really been changed too much. It's been open, what, six years now, Smuggles Cove, I think? Yeah, six years. Right. And the room menu actually hadn't been changed too much at all in kind of four or five years, really. Yeah, well, we realised this, didn't we? We kind of looked at what we were submitting to imbibe for the room list of the year, and I think for three or four years years, on the bounce, it was just the same thing. And it especially I think a mixture of obviously just that realisation then also 
the amount of new things that were becoming available, it just seems stupid to like not really start to draw in all these new and interesting things and try them out. And I think obviously, like like you were saying, Andy, you were devising this menu for a long time, researching, refining. Um, I'd sometimes just like, you know, pop in and have a little look at, at, at what you were kind of picking and choosing from. And you kind of explained to me why you went a certain direction and, and discounted some others. Um, from my point of view, like, to be honest, I've always kind of been Andy's protege in a, in a weird way. So like when I came in, Andy was like the person that sort of like started training me up initially. So a lot of rum that I got introduced to, and as a result, this kind of menu that has now been developed, mainly been like kind of talked through by Andy, you know, he's kind of relayed a lot of the information to me. And then obviously I've kind of taken some of that information away and gone off and done some of my own research on things and to be honest most work that we do any rum related stuff we kind of end up doing it together because it's kind of like what you were saying earlier about you know the business and the idea it's quite nice to have another opinion there you know it's nice to bounce ideas off each other if we have work on menus it's just always nice to kind of like two heads are better than one right you know it's just it's a lot nicer to have something to talk about um but I think when it came to some of the the rum stuff and focusing more on what we had behind the bar not just the cocktail menu for me personally it actually stems a little bit from like, <laughs> as weird as it sounds, it stems from like fear. So like when I started bartending, like I said, I, I came into it quite late on. I was always quite like introverted. And obviously like getting behind any kind of bar, you do just have to sort of like open up, open yourself up a little bit, you know, and you've got to be a bit more vocal. And especially behind a bar like Smugglers, it's very, very lively. There's a lot of like big characters behind there, you know, so you can't just kind of like, get by just shuffling along and not really speaking and, and making your voice heard. When I first went into there, as I said earlier on, it's kind of like the atmosphere in there really impressed me and the knowledge of the bartenders. So I kind of went in thinking that everyone stood behind every bar and knew exactly what they were doing. 100%. I thought that they knew about all the bottles. They could recommend anything to you. And I thought that was kind of like the standard. So I already set the bar quite high for myself anyway, so I jumped straight into trying to learn as much as I could. And then I actually found that not everyone always does know what they're talking about, but I also saw in a lot of instances firsthand how negative that can sort of look. If someone doesn't know what they're talking about, you know, it kind of really impedes on the customer experience, and, and that's the kind of thing that we've always been about. It's been really, really kind of getting people to engage and open their eyes and, you know, help them try something new. And if you yourself don't know what you're talking about, it's very, very difficult to do that. So I personally, and kind of, I've always encouraged with training going forward, that, that sort of, that side of things, you know, really getting, getting into, into the weeds with all these different, all these different brands and different styles and, really getting people to interact with it you know and when we do training as well as the practical side of things and get making sure people know the recipes and whatnot um you know we're getting them to actively try a little bit try some rums get them out of their comfort zone a little bit explain some stuff to them and obviously the only way that we can do that is by knowing ourselves what we're talking about so it's why we constantly try and stay ahead of the curve when it comes to yeah just products we're getting in brands we're getting in so then if someone turns around to us whether it be a member of staff or whether it be, you know, one of the higher ups asking why are you adding this to the menu? We can say, you know, in the rum world, this is, this is like one of the next big things. It's really, really popular. It's if we're one of the only people in the North of the country that have got this bottle, it actually might encourage some people to come in and, and, you know, it's a nice talking point. It's good for social media, et cetera, et cetera. So I feel like we have hopefully got ourselves to a point now where we're quite trusted you know, within uh, within our workplace to kind of like take the reins a little bit with this stuff. Um, it's not always been the case, has it? You know, um, it took a long time to kind of like develop that relationship and that trust to ensure that we're kind of like focusing on the right things and we're not just buying new products for the sake of it just because we want to try them ourselves. Bottom line, it is, it is a business, isn't it? And we have to make sure that what we're getting in is going to sell and, and kind of push the business forward. Um, I'd like to think we've kind of managed to, to walk that tightrope quite successfully, I, th I guess. I think we're, uh, we're, we're certainly getting there from going back to your question, Dave, from like what you said going forward. I think we're almost there. I quite like to get rid of 
maybe about 20, 20 i think we're on about 196 now rums right it's like just under 200 yeah give or take a couple of there. ones out of stock or whatever um, yeah. i'd quite like to take off a couple of, like about 20 that i just don't really see have a role like in their own outright specific thing I think if I could get rid is, of those... Is that down to the fact it hasn't sold, lack of focus from the brand itself, or lack of focus from your bartenders who can't really make anything out of it? Yeah. I think it's kind of a bit of everything. It's not... Mm. Uh, maybe it's... The way I've kind of done it with the new stuff, the newer stuff anyway, it's like... There has to be a reason for everything being on that menu, in my head. And up. there's some of, some of the stuff that's maybe a little bit older that we've had sat, sat around for a few years. Again, it's been sat around for a few years, which isn't really a good sign either. Sure. Um, and yeah, it might be like, you know, the brands have really come in or spoke to us or no one's really known about it too much other than maybe me and Jack. And then we're trying to shift it because we kind of want to get rid of it so we can actually get something else in that might be a bit newer and a bit more interesting and might appeal to a few more people customer wise um but yeah there's there's some stuff there that's just it just for whatever reason doesn't quite work it's kind of it can be a combination of things yeah um or whether it's might have just fallen out of fashion you know um or kind of just been lost a little bit in you know the other 195 but yeah no, it happens occasionally but in terms of the process of putting new ones on that i don't think hopefully it's not going to stop us too much with this happening you know it's still a pretty big company i think no one yeah. really um questions our opinions too much about uh, about these things you know i think um everyone in the company understands well, I'd like to think they understand what me and Jack do. Certainly people that know us will certainly know that we probably know the most. So we're, we're not doing it um, in a kind of willy-nilly, kind of half arsed not thought through way. It's like we, we, we think about all these variables before anything goes on the menu. Um, yeah. And we, certainly we added a few little bits a couple of months ago. Um, again, that we're all really interested in him. It was um oh I won't I won't tell you Dave because you get mad. <laughs> it was a I think well, of, uh, Martinique agricole. I think you went so far. <laughs> we uh, obviously sometimes it goes a little bit off personal preference as well what we choose, but kind of like what what ends up coming along with that is the fact that because we've chosen it ourselves and we personally are kind of like invested in a product we end up selling quite a lot as a result, you know? So like a prime example is um, we, well, we got a lot of the four square, the exceptional cast selection products in uh, when they were released. Um, but unfortunately we had like a lot of delays with the, the, the menu printouts and smugglers for like the new rum listings and stuff. Um, and we got um, some of the Zinfandel, you know, cask blend in there, which is great um, price wise, you know, for the money it's, it's fantastic. And it's, it's very, very different. And it's certainly, something that I would deem quite an, a nice sort of like entry level sipping it was like an entry level sipping rum. I think we sold what like two, two and a half bottles of that and we never even had it listed or advertised yeah. anywhere in the place that we had it in stock. It was not a menu at all, yeah. It, it was purely just like word of mouth. It was what we were pushing. Um and obviously like, you know, we, we told some staff about it and let them try it and as a result they could try and push it a little bit as well. Um and I think that's the way that that a lot of it works in there um obviously yeah like andy was saying fingers crossed this situation isn't going to affect us too drastically long term anyway obviously in the short term it's going to be interesting to see what happens i was listening to something the other day um uh, they were comparing kind of like the short term and long long term impacts of this current situation they were saying it's kind of like the equivalent of um like the bombings during the war, you know, right now we're the equivalent of the people that were kind of like sheltered underground, just waiting for it all to blow over. It's when you actually come out and you see the devastation as to you can evaluate where you're at, you know? So I think once, once places start to open up and we see what restrictions are in place and what we kind of have to work with and how that impacts, 
you know, like style of service and, and how much we can sell and what we can even display on the bar, like when we've been in talks about how we're going to be up and functioning, you know, wh- when we do reopen. It's likely it's going to be limited. Like the, the less touch points there are on the bar, the better and more hygienic it is, you know. Um, it, it avoids sort of like extra cleaning and sanitation and things like that. So whether in the short term we're going to actually be able to display on the bar all the bottles we have um, or whether we can, you know, it's very going to be very difficult to lay out half a dozen bottles for someone and they can pick them up and have a look at the labels and then, you know, maybe try a little sip of one and then try another. It's short term. I don't think that's going to be something that's feasible or safe for us to do, um, which does impact, you know, our style of service a little bit as you or anyone that's been in smugglers knows. It's sort of all about the atmosphere in there. It's not a super spacious venue. It's kind of dark and dingy and it's atmospheric. You know, we've got the live music on, the dim lights. Um, it's it's busy and it's loud on, on an evening and that's kind of what we're all about. If we have to sort of like switch to a style of service that's, um, you know, table service, less people in there, things like that. If it's not possible for customers to always come up to the bartenders to speak to them about recommendations and stuff. It starts to get a bit more difficult. Um, so I think short term is of course going to impact us as much as it is going to impact people anywhere else. I'm hoping that long term it doesn't impede on the progress that we've made so far. And hopefully we will still be able to invest in, in new products and keep pushing it forward, you know, and myself and Andy like this year this kind of like YouTube channel and Instagram that we've started it was sort of like in the pipeline anyway it's what we wanted to do it's like a bit of a side project but a big thing this year was sort of like getting ourselves out there obviously Manchester Rum Fest was a big date in the calendar the London Rum Fest uh, London Cocktail Week Imbibe all those things like that we really wanted to like get ourselves there you know and be present um kind of like your take with the whole drinks enthusiast um project this for us was sort of the same deal of course we work at smugglers and we represent new world trading company um but we didn't want all of our social media and our projects to kind of be centered necessarily around that we did want to be our own entity and of course big ourselves up and big up our company but also you know be able to go to another bar and take pictures or go to events and, and promote people and places and products and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately this is kind of basically just like swept the rug from under, from under us for now. Um, but yeah, it's not, gonna, it's not going to stop us selling rum. Yeah. By any stretch, hopefully it's just, a, stretch, hopefully it's just a little blip, a little blip. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, oh, if well. still, yeah, still if there's something that we like that we want to get into smugglers. We'll, we're going to order it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, Any time, Dave, don't worry. <laughs> Certainly that 2005, have you got any knocking around? 2005, 1931, Chairman's, we knew Admiral Rodney offices for lease. Yeah. Plus a bottle of Toz. Yeah. I actually bought I'm from Woodport, not... would you believe? Oh, Really? I won't tell you where, just there's only a couple of bottles left. So I don't want this to be broadcast. Oh, you... sell out. So I'll tell you once <laughs> to stop recording. I was going to say, <laughs> so I'll stop now. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I think uh, that, pr- well, if that doesn't cover everything, then it's only been about three hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I don't know what does, uh, but that's usually our conversations anyway. Um, yeah, true. To be honest with you. It's just another <laughs> training session, isn't it? Uh, well, yeah, it was what about an eight-hour training session? <laughs> one time, <laughs> so, That's a, yeah. one hour drinking, one hour training session, seven-hour drinking session, probably yeah. more of an accurate um, split, you know. <laughs> so we oh, kind of, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'd like a hurricane right now. Actually, be pretty good. Certainly, um, the weather. You know, it's it's been one thing that's been so disappointing this last couple of months. I don't think we've ever had such a nice. Period, sort of, of like weather. springtime period the weather's been unreal like it would have been such nice opportunities just to go out sit outside drink some cocktails oh. um it's just like <laughs> it's just typical isn't it that it's been yeah. i can guarantee as well you know if, if things do start to get up and running in the next like month to two months 
the weather's just going to turn awful again, you know? Like, yeah. Guarantee. <laughs> guarantee it. Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, so I guess before we go, Dave, um, do you want to let people know that might not be following you on social media and whatnot, kind of like where they can follow you and see what you're up to or reach out to you potentially about, you know, future projects and stuff? Yeah, of course. So obviously, Drinks Enthusiast is is me, um, you know, one-man band. Um, obviously, give us a follow, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, just literally search for Drinks Enthusiast, it comes straight up. Uh, obviously, Mansion Run Fest has its own social media pages. That's obviously August 29th. Even though the tickets aren't available, uh, there may still be ways we're going to go online with a couple of these things, uh, although that's obviously in the talks. So give us a follow on that. Rum on the Couch is not a daily thing, but I'm going to put as many videos as I can up. A uh, little short 15-minute max of different brands. I've got some ideas what I'm going to do for the rest of the week, if not next. So they'll be constantly going up. That's actually got its own Twitter page now, which is literally at Rum on the Couch. Well, to Rumfest itself, just give it a search. There's only one Rumfest in Manchester, so it's easy to find. Um, and yeah, if anyone's got any questions, or if if anyone from the trade is watching this and wants to, you know, see what else I have available, but they're coming up with ideas out of lockdown. And obviously, consumers, if there's any um, tastings they want to get involved with, um, I usually have, every time something is put together. Uh, it goes straight to my social media, so you'll know where I am and get yourself involved. And of course, try something different. Easy peasy. Amazing. I think that's quite definitely your to... fucking turn, Jack Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so I'm giving the spiel then. So Enthusiasm. Obviously... <laughs> <laughs> right, game face. <laughs> yeah, so of course, if you're watching this, it's very likely going to be on YouTube. So our YouTube account, just run with it or one word, um, you'll be able to see a backlog of our videos that we've been producing on there for the last couple of months. Uh, everything from just like general chit chat and rum geekiness through to a series that we're doing at the moment called Rum Dementals that's covering everything from, you know, selection and processing of raw materials right through to post distillation methods, uh, basically just giving like the, a basic rundown on how rum's made. So all that's on our YouTube, uh, we're hoping to do more things like this, get people on uh, while we get a chance to snag very busy people uh, before all this lockdown ends. We're going to try and catch up with some people and have a little bit of a chat um, and cover some sort of wider bases. So, yeah, that'll all be on the YouTube. Uh, we often post about it in advance on Instagram, exactly the same address, just run with it um, or one word. We'll often post little clips of these kind of conversations and let you know in advance if new ones are going to be released. Um, and of course, when we are back up and running, come and see us in Smuggler's Cove on the Albert Dock in Liverpool and drink some cocktails and have some rum. And if you, if you mention that you've been watching us or following us on social media, um, we'll definitely uh, look to hook you up, that's for sure. And I think yeah, that's it. We're gonna, uh, we'll give you loads of free chairmans from Dave. <laughs> 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 <Not a deal. laughs> on that note 